Well, good evening. We are glad that you're here tonight. It's a good time for us to be here. It's an exceptional time, I think, for us to be here and to remember God's good plan for us as his people, certainly in light of all that's going on in our, uh, in our own Jerusalem and Judea. You have, uh, I'm sure, been impacted in one way or another by all that's going on, and there are a lot of hurting people in our uh, vicinity. There have been uh, almost a half a million people misplaced, or displaced, I should say, or told to evacuate at one point or another, and uh, we as a staff have been praying uh, for your protection in particular, and we've been praying for opportunities for ministry, but with all the, uh, just the onslaught of information, negative information about the uh, really negative situation that we face in Southern California, I thought it'd be appropriate for us to begin just by a, a little perspective building exercise to get back into God's Word and some basic principles of God's Word, uh, just to remind ourselves uh, how to respond in times like these. Uh, and if this is not directly affecting you at one time or another in this time that is to be characterized by wars and famines and uh, all kinds of things according to the scripture, we uh, will inevitably hit a time when all of us are impacted in some profound and poignant way by the disasters that mark the times. So I look through my file this week and uh, as God would have it, uh, nine years ago to the day on October 25th, I had to uh, presented to some of you old-timers that were with me back then a message on uh, Y2K mania. And I don't know if you remember all that, but we were uh, gathering on October 25th, uh, 1998, to try and respond to the hyperactivity of the world as they said the sky was falling. And uh, the Christian community, hopefully as a corrective, to kind of wake up a few people and say, what in the world are you talking about? As they were encouraging us to uh, brush up on our, uh, on our sharpshooting skills and build a bunker and uh, be ready to protect our frosted flakes and SpaghettiOs that we have stored up in our, in our bunkers. And uh, you laugh now, but your favorite Christian radio talk show hosts were leading the charge in this. And uh, I, was, uh, I was definitely, uh, I mean, I lost a lot of friends during that whole period who thought I was just uh, pie in the sky and uh, had the wrong perspective on this. But you might remember, if you were with us in 1998, that we were looking at the Sermon on the Mount, knowing full well that Vespian and Nero and all the persecutors of the church were just around the corner and Jesus presents to these folks uh, some simple truths that you may think only applied to the times of prosperity when the stock market was doing well in Orange County. But he said, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're going to put on. Don't worry about your clothing. Don't worry about your food. As a matter of fact, the punchline in the Sermon on the Mount, I think, uh, comes in, into clear focus when he said, uh, seek first the kingdom, and, and then everything else is going to take care of itself. All the other things you need, don't worry about it. Get the right priorities in place. And uh, I think it's important for us just to resonate with that for a few minutes. Uh, Jesus knew that times of trouble were coming for those people. Their, their homes would be raided. Their, uh, their, their lives would be threatened. They would be persecuted. And he didn't want them to freak out. And, and I'm, I'm a little concerned in the day of 24-hour news that we are so often easily moved off of our center uh, to sit around and, and with the rest of the world be filled with trepidation and worry. So I want to turn you to a quick passage before we get into the topic of the night in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, familiar verses to you, I hope. But let us remember the explicit teaching of God's word as everyone is lamenting the loss of the 15 plus fires that have gone on here in Southern California. And I hope you recognize this is not a uh, unsympathetic response. I realize that uh, when your house goes up in smoke and uh, when it's 24-hour news about uh, a loss, that, uh, that it hurts. Pain hurts. We recognize that. But no matter what's going on externally, here's the clear teaching of Scripture, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6. Do you remember this verse? 
Do not be anxious about anything, nothing. Meridzomai is the root word of that, that word anxiety, that my mind is pulled in all different directions. And, and uh, you know, at, at the risk of sounding like a psycho babbler, uh, I, you know, it, it just comes down to staying centered on what God has for us, his agenda for us, our relationship with him. Don't stink and freak out. That's, that's Mike Fabara's translation there. You got nothing in this world to freak out about. And we ought to be, while the world's running around, whether it's a Y2K scare or whether the, uh, the moon and the, and the sun are red for the next three months, uh, we're not freaking out about it. Uh, we don't worry. If you want to make a sermonette out of this, this is point number one. We don't worry. We are not anxious. We are not called as God's people to worry about anything. But our response in times of trouble is to deepen our relationship with God in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your requests to God. And I know we're privileged to do this here uh, at our staff meeting, but I don't know, we had 40 people around the table on Wednesday, uh, spending uh, extended times in prayer, just lifting you up before God and making sure that we stay centered on the biblical principles and, 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 and unmoved. If you are taking notes on the sermonette, you might want to jot down Romans chapter 8. We went here nine years ago to the day to remind you that no matter what happens externally, whether it's things uh, present or future, Paul says, whether height or depth or Anything in creation, life, death, angels, principalities, it doesn't matter. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. There are some things in your life that are immovable. And we need to be that way in our heart. And I love Proverbs, and that was Romans 8, 31, in essence, I summarized through 39. Proverbs 28, 1 is great. It says, the wicked man flees, though no one pursues him. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. We're not afraid of anything. There's nothing here on earth that we're afraid of. We fear God, but we've made peace with God. And if God is for us, as Paul said, who can be against us? Or as he ends the passage, what can be against us? Now, we're not saying pain doesn't hurt and loss isn't a loss. We're just saying there's nothing, there's nothing going to move us off center. So number one, we don't worry. We're not stressed out. We're not freaked out. And if you find yourself doing that, there's some spiritual adjustments that need to take place. Here's the reason we're not. Number two, we as God's people trust God. In the midst of some trepidatious situations, we are trusting God. Here's what the Bible says is, as the disciples stood around concerned about their leader uh, leaving. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled, John 14, 1. Do you remember this passage? Here's the, the succinct and clear directive. Trust in God and trust also in me. We need to trust God, and that certainly the focus, and we've got to focus on what we're not to do, and that's we don't worry, but we are to trust in God. Because as uh, Jesus responded in quoting uh, the, the Old Testament to the tempter in Matthew 4, man doesn't live by bread alone. You are not sustained because your house isn't burnt or because the flames aren't in your backyard or because your computers work or the chips in our uh, satellites aren't uh, you know, think, making things fall out of the sky. Uh, the bottom line is we live because God decides for us to live, and uh, we are fully dependent on what he says. His decrees coming from his mouth are our life and death. If God wants you dead tonight, you're not going to live to tomorrow. And if he wants you alive tomorrow, there ain't a fire in the world that's going to uh, snuff your life out before it's time. Uh, we don't live by external things. We live by the decree of God. Lastly, and I suppose most importantly, and it's a good reminder when the real poignant tragedies strike, like the next gigantic earthquake, uh, and, and you know we're due one, aren't we? It's been a while. Uh, number one, we said we don't worry, we don't freak out. Number two, we trust in God. And number three, when it comes to the practical issues of life, we rely on each other. We rely on each other. One of the reasons I see my neighbors freaking out uh, over issues like this is they really don't have a support system. They might have a few biological relatives, but, you know, half of those they don't depend on. The other half they don't talk to, you know, and a couple of them they, they can't stand or whatever their situations are. Uh, but we have the, the family of God. We call a meeting to talk about eschatology and we fill the room up. Uh, we, we have meals together. Uh, we're committed to one another. We are supposed to follow in the pattern of Christ of laying our lives down for one another. We rely on each other. And I don't know if you remember, probably the most memorable line from that October 25th, 1998 sermon as we looked at all the doom and gloom of what everyone was saying about the Y2K um, uh, 
problem, turned out not to be much of a problem, uh, was uh, if we have a disaster, do you remember the one-liner? What are we supposed to do? What I say? Meet here, right? Because we rely on each other. And we have to, if we have to hunt coyotes down in Aliso Canyon and have, uh, you know, Nick Sofa cook it over a barbecue and Sam Funk, you know, whatever, create kebabs out of a garden we're growing on the roof, we are a community uh, that is going to survive the practical challenges of the world as we rely on each other. And I'm telling you, it's going to happen. There's going to be things that are going to uh, disrupt our lives. I mean, when all your cell phones go down and the electricity is off and the water's not clean, I just want to let you know, after I secure the basics in my home, if I'm still alive, I'm going to meet you here, okay? And we're going to deal with whatever comes our way. And, and if you want to try and make it on your own, you're, you're, you're free to do that. But our response to problems, uh, here's just a word from Acts chapter 2, is to uh, have everything in common and be willing to, here's what the early church was doing, Acts 2.45, sell their possessions and goods and give to anyone who has need. And every day the early church with looming persecution just around the corner continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread together and when they had homes, they ate in their homes and did it with glad and sincere hearts. Uh, and by the way, in chapter 4, they said there wasn't a need among them. And, and our commitment is to one another. We're not just out there on our own. Uh, we, we don't worry. We don't freak out. We trust in God, and we rely on each other. Uh, it doesn't make uh, the pain go away uh, necessarily, but it certainly centers our life and allows us to face whatever comes our way uh, as a team. Okay? So just that's a sermonette for you, just a small sermonette. But I thought it'd be appropriate, as we did in staff meeting this week, to spend a little time together uh, just praying for opportunities. Uh, because you realize the fire of, of, of an arson or a downed power line is not the fire uh, that we should be worried about for our neighbors in Southern California. According to 2 Peter chapter 3, the present world is reserved. He says not only the present earth, but the present heavens are reserved by the powerful decreed word of God reserved for one element, and that's for fire. One day, the fire that will erupt as a result of God's wrath is the one I don't want my neighbor to incur. So that's the real concern, and opportunities for ministry in times of, of, of difficulty uh, are great because God can use those tragedies to bring people to Christ. So let's pray for those opportunities. Let's pray that we will be able to, as a church, as I know some of you have, reach out and meet practical needs as we have down in San Diego with uh, Pastor Hal's church, and I don't know how many of you have been involved in that, but, um, but let's pray. Let's pray that we'll make the most of this opportunity and make a difference. Pray with me. God, we want to pause here at the beginning of our, our uh, study time tonight to just uh, lift up before you those that are, uh, that are hurting. We know some are hurting for all the wrong reasons, uh, God, and we know some that uh, have such a focus on this life without a focus on the next perhaps need this tragedy to wake them up, to open their eyes. We pray by our loving compassion, by our words of perspective, by our... Um, uh, our strength in light of difficult circumstances, uh, God, even by our, our mental um, uh, perspective, our peace that surpasses understanding, I pray, would be the vehicle, the bridge, the opportunity, the catalyst for us to be able to see people recognize your son as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I pray that we could do our best as representatives and ambassadors of you in this world uh, to really shine brightly, especially in times of difficulty. So, God, we pray uh, that those that have been um, uh, affected by this um, uh, massive set of fires around our, our own uh, backyard here would, uh, God, find those Christians around them and that we would find them and be able to bring them to a place of understanding the big picture, that the, really the earthbound temporal issues of life are uh, they're fleeting and they're passing. The real concern that we have, God, is for eternity because one day we'll meet you face to face and the only hope that we'll have is a relationship that we have cultivated with Jesus Christ, your son. So I pray, God, for perspective. I pray for strength. I pray for stability. And I pray, God, for us that we would have opportunities for ministry. We thank you for all that's going, down, uh, going on down at New Song, the way we were able to partner with them to reach out and help. We pray for those that are 
hundreds of those sleeping on the floor there of the church building, that uh, even as Pastor Dale has been down there ministering among them, that we would be able to lead them to a place of recognizing their need for Jesus Christ. And for those that know you, God, strengthen their faith. May they be people of prayer, dependent on you, developing a kind of trust in you that is a result, that, that as a result, doesn't allow their hearts to be troubled, even in difficult times. God, we lift up the, uh, the need, the rebuilding process, uh, just the whole uh, the mess that uh, results from this kind of thing, and pray that you would help us not just to be getting back to normal, but God, may we uh, see this community, and even around here in some of the, the high-end homes that have been burnt and communities that have been affected, may people, God, reach out to you, not just as, a, uh, as just some kind of, of short-term foxhole uh, kind of prayer that, where they reach out to you for temporal help, but that people would see the big picture, be able to reach out to you in repentance and faith and become genuine followers of Christ. So God, we lift up this trial to you for those that it's affected personally here. Uh, God, we pray that you'd give them grace. I know that many have taken in their relatives from Escondido and, and Valley Center and, uh, and uh, all through the, uh, the inland uh, pass there and the valley through uh, Oceanside and Rancho Bernardo. And I pray, God, that as they're in our homes and we minister to them personally, that we would be able to be that kind of rock and that directional indicator that points them to a place of a genuine, vibrant relationship with you. God, we thank you so much that uh, we're aliens and strangers in this world, that this world is not our home, that we look forward to, as this world is reserved for a kind of, of uh, destruction that is going to be just because of your response to sin, that we are looking forward to, as Peter said, uh, a home of righteousness, a place where righteousness and what is right, it dwells and reigns supreme. So God, I look forward to that. I pray that we all would. We would deepen our hope in the Maranatha, the coming of Christ, that we would be so in, 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 uh, anticipating in our hearts the arrival of our King, that all the things of this world will grow strangely dim. So God, help us in this regard, I pray. Make us strong. Let, our, let us set our hopes clearly uh, and, our, and our confidence clearly on all the grace that is to be brought to us at the coming of Christ. Thanks for this study. Now, as we concentrate for a few minutes here on the rapture, I pray that you would help us understand your word even better tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good things planned for us in God's economy. And if you have your worksheet, I want to just jump into it uh, without introduction and remind you that it's always good to have a chart at the beginning of the worksheet. If you were to look up the word rapture in your Bible's English concordance, you may not even find the word, uh, depending on what translation you use. So this is an issue that needs to be dealt with. What about this word rapture? What are we talking about? Most of us understand it in the context of eschatology, something about it, but let's kind of, of, of go back in time and find uh, the concept here and, and understand something of it linguistically. First column, let's think about New Testament Greek. You do understand that the Bible was written in three languages, primarily Hebrew in the Old Testament, a little Aramaic, and in the New Testament it's Greek. We've got the concept of the church, and the rapture in the New Testament. So we go to the New Testament to find the word. The Greek word that is used uh, to, uh, to represent this eschatological future concept is the Greek word harpazo, harpazo. And what might be uh, uh, becoming a pattern now in your thinking as a student of the Bible is that words like this are often used in a technical sense and in a non-technical sense, much like the word apostle used in a technical sense of the 12, and it's also used in a non-technical sense as those that are sent, messengers, angelos, angels, same thing. We have words that are used in a technical sense, and usually we put it with a capital letter at the beginning, and then a non-technical sense. And so it is with the word harpazo. You'll find it, by the way, 14 times in the New Testament. Most of those times are used in a non-technical sense. Okay, let me give you a few examples of that. For instance, we'll find the Greek word harpazo in the New Testament as Jesus illustrates things, for instance, in his, uh, in his parable of the robber coming to take your goods. And uh, that was the context of the strong man having to be bound. You can't steal his stuff lest you bind him up. But you've got the robber coming in and harpazoing his, his possessions. When someone sneaks in and takes your stuff at night, uh, that's a harpazo, right? That's the, the, their their are podzoing it from you. 
Also, Jesus tells a lot of uh, agrarian illustrations about things being plucked away or taken out, and uh, the illustration of a wolf coming in and kind of sneaking in there and grabbing a, a, a lamb and taking off with it, that's another use of the word in the New Testament, harpazo. Sheep are harpazoed by wolves. Uh, also, Jesus tells stories about prisoners being taken by an army, uh, the army that is not on your side, uh, prisoners of war. You've got someone coming in and harpazoing you. Um, and I didn't have room for this one, but uh, even Christians who are trying to lead people to Christ, the end of the book of Jude, it says we are harpazoing them from the flames. Uh, and that's an appropriate uh, uh, phrase, which I didn't have room for here and uh, should have thrown in here in light of the context of what's going on. But when we take someone and we lead them to Christ and they become a convert of, of Jesus, uh, we are harpazoing them. Those are some of the uses of the word. The one we're interested in is the one in Scripture that speaks of people being harpazoed by God, much like a robber taking possessions or a wolf taking away a, a, a lamb or an army taking a prisoner. Uh, in Scripture, we have this picture of God harpazoing his people. Okay? Now, where do we get the word rapture from? That comes from the Latin Vulgate. Uh, hopefully, you understand that. If not, let me give you a quick background on the end of the 4th century of course, Greek was dying out unless you were in, uh, in the Byzantine Empire. And so we translated the Bible into the language of the day, which was Latin. And so Latin became the prevailing language of, of Christianity and, uh, and theology. And in the Latin Vulgate, which is an important Bible, it's been an important translation of the church for centuries, starting in the late 4th century, uh, we have uh, the word translating harpazo, uh, rapio. Rapio. Rapio, the, uh, the Latin word, we start to see where we're going to get this English word, right? This is the basis of it. When you see harpazo, not every time, and unfortunately, uh, these Latin concordances aren't easy to find, but I did my best count in my Vulgate today, and I came up with about 16, but uh, don't quote me on that. Rapio. It's the same use as harpazo. Same way, technical sense, non-technical sense. And a couple other ways that they take Greek words and translate it uh, to rapio, you'll see that root uh, translated harpazo. Almost every time you see harpazo, you see rapio. Well, that's where we get the English word. In today's English, we get the word rapture, rapture. Now, here's the problem. If you look up the word rapture in a dictionary, you're not going to find what we're looking for tonight. But there is a connection, so I thought I would point it out. Uh, when you look up the word rapture, you'll find words like this, bliss. You'll find words like ecstasy. You'll find words like extreme joy. If someone, uh, as it relates to rapture, they, they have this, uh, this incredible uh, feeling of extreme happiness. Okay? But you need to recognize where that comes from. Okay, the concept here comes from rapio in, 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 in uh, Latin, and that is that my feelings or emotions are down here, so to speak, and they get transported or caught up into a high level of delight or joy or happiness. So there's the picture. It does relate to, to the concept of harpazo, and that is that I, you know, I'm just going along, and all of a sudden I, there's this rapture of my soul, which is a concept related to my feelings or emotions being caught up or transported into a feeling of delight or joy. Okay? Now, Bible translations take the word harpazo, and though we do have the English word uh, rapture come through the Vulgate into English, uh, most modern translations dump the word altogether. We don't even have it. Uh, but here are some of the translations of harpazo in your New Testaments. Okay? You have phrases like this that we'll see in one of the key passages. You'll have the phrase caught up. And that's our, our, our central passage for tonight, though we'll look at others in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The people of God are caught up into the air. You'll also find the phrase, taken away. That one, I think, is the one used of the sheep are taken away by the wolves. You'll see gathered up as another translation of the phrase. Or, I'm sorry, of the word. Caught up, taken away, gathered up. Snatched away, 
sometimes used as a positive that God uh, snatches away his people or used as a negative in that, uh, remember the passage that uh, no one can snatch them from my hand, right? The, the people, the sheep, they hear my voice, they know me, they follow me, and, 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 and no one can take them, no one can take them, snatch them from my hand. There's our word harpazo, caught up, taken up, gathered up, snatched away, okay? So just for the sake of having a chart, I can see that's brought pleasantness to your face. We can move on to an outline. The word rapture. You've just in, you're enraptured tonight. Now, what we're concerned about is the eschatological concept. We want to talk about the concept. Okay? You'll find this concept in a lot of places where you don't find the word harpazo. Uh, think of the passage we just quoted, John chapter 14, verse 1. He says, don't uh, let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Because in my Father's house, verse 2, there are many rooms or dwelling places. Remember how this goes? Now, if I go away, I'll go away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you'll be also. The concept is everywhere. That God uh, has sent his son into the world, he will leave the world, and he will come back to get his people. John, I just used that one because we just quoted it. John chapter 14, verse 1. Don't see the word harpazo there, but you see the concept. He'll receive you unto himself that where he is, you'll be also. Okay? But the passage I want to camp on for a while is this one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, the most extensive, detailed explanation of the harpazoing of the church. And we need to look at it because it's full of, of information that will be helpful to us. There's no other passage of Scripture that gives us more information on the catching up or the harpazo of the church than this text. So let's read it, and then let's tear it apart a little bit, and I think I have how many points there for you? Four, A, B, C, D. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you can see the pastoral concern of the Apostle Paul. People had died, they're a little concerned about their, their dead relatives. And he says in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, Brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Fall asleep, it's not narcolepsy, it's not people that are tired. This is a euphemism for death, right? You've got friends that have died. I don't want you to grieve like the rest of men or the rest of the world who have no hope. Okay. We've got hope. It's different when your people in your church die. Verse 14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Okay, He died, but he's, he's back to life. He's in his body again. Uh, he's in a resurrected body. We, we know that. And we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, those that are Christians that have died, don't worry. Just like Christ has been resurrected, people are going to be resurrected. Now, verse 15, according to the Lord's own word, or according to the authority of the Lord, more on that another time, we tell you that we who are still alive and are left until the coming of the Lord. Okay, now we're not talking about people that have died that are Christians, but we're still here, and Christ happens to come back in our day. We will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, don't worry, your dead uh, relative or Christian friend, uh, they're not going to miss out on the coming of the Lord. Don't worry. Okay. Now, verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel, which only by name, by the way, is only one guy. Who is he? Michael. Thank you. I just thought I'd bring that up. Mikhail. Michael. Who is like God, the archangel. So Michael's got the uh, privilege here. Hey, I know. My name's Mike, by the way, if you, did, if you didn't know that. It's just it's like no connect. Thank you. Somebody made that connection now. It's my namesake, an angel. The archangel. He's not just an angel. Michael's not just any angel. He's the archangel. Ark, you know what that means, right? No, it's not, a, it's not one of those. Ark, the first. Arche, the Greek word arche, the first. The the first, the, the guy in charge. He's the guy in charge. The archangel, Michael. Mike. Well, you don't want to call him that. but Because he's in charge. Mr. Michael, the archangel. Anyway, sorry. The Lord himself will come down from heaven, a loud command, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ, Christians now, will rise first. Okay? There will be a resurrection there. 
After that, we who are still alive and are left will be, what's our word? Harpazo. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, by the way, if you're mourning over a, 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 a lost Christian friend who's dead now, he says, encourage each other with these words. Because it's not over for them and they're not going to miss out on the coming of the Lord. Matter of fact, they're going to be seeing him before you do. Okay? In a resurrected body. So let's tear this apart a little bit. First thing we recognize about this letter A is that whatever it is, look at verse 16. The Lord himself will come down with a loud command. Is it a soft command or a loud command? It's a loud one. The voice of the archangel and a trumpet call of God. That is, let's put it down, letter A, a loud return. Whatever it is, the scripture is saying this is a big deal. This is not some silent, secret event. I'm sorry, I'm clicking it, aren't I? A loud return. This is a big deal. This is a loud thing. The, the voice of the archangel, a, a loud command, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God. Okay? So that starts it. Not a lot of comment there, but you've got more space than you need. Bottom line is, it's a loud return. Not silent, not secret. Secondly, it involves a resurrection. Context here is that your dead Christian friend who died a year ago or five years ago or 15 years ago is not going to miss out on this. They are going to be resurrected. Okay? He will bring, verse 14, he will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, it says, bottom of verse 16, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, this is helpful for us, and it helps you because uh, there's a lot of heresy out there about the resurrection. We're going to look at this in more detail on one night, but you need to recognize what's happening. If you read it carefully, verse 14 says, he's bringing those who have fallen asleep then it says in, in verse 16, the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, which is it? Are they rising up or are they coming down? Do you see the difference here? They're coming down, it seems, with him, but then they're rising up. This is what we call the dichotomy, the, the two-part uh, definition of, of who we are. We are two parts. And I know some people think this is heresy, but it's not. He made Adam out of the dust of the earth. That's biological material. And then he breathed into him the breath of life. Okay? The concept in scripture is that I am physical and I am spiritual. I am the same guy I was uh, t nine years ago tonight when I was preaching from, from that passage in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Same guy. But according to uh, the chemist and the scientist and the doctors, I don't have one cell in my body that's the same. It's, they've been completely replenished in the last nine years. So am I not me anymore? Well, no, I'm a different me. I, I lament the fact that I'm a different me from nine years ago. But I'm the same me. Why? Because the spirit is the same. I am the software and I am the hardware. The hardware is changing. It's a biological thing. The software... Uh, is, is, is not. Hopefully it is changing. It's, it's, it's becoming more like Christ, I hope, and it is, sanctification. But uh, I'm two parts, dichotomy. Okay? Some people like to believe in a trichotomy. I don't. I believe in a dichotomy, uh, and that's another sermon too. But if we're two parts here, I got two concerns. I got the concern about the spirit, and I got the concern about the body. There are those that believe in soul sleep, and one of the reasons they do is because of a passage like this. They believe that your dead relative, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah Witnesses, there's a lot of people and a lot of other you know, evangelical groups, they believe that when you die, you go unconscious. okay? And then, at the trumpet call of God, you raise up. But that's really not a careful reading of this passage. Because it says there, in verse number 14, that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. Now, I'm thinking, wait a minute, I just buried you know, Uncle Albert. He's here physically, but the concept of a dichotomy allows me to understand what happens to him spiritually. The software goes somewhere. Turn to a, keep your finger here because we're going to be back to 1 Thess 4, but I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just so that we have no confusion about this at all. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now notice carefully the wording in this text. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. Now we know... That if this earthly tent or tabernacle, this thing I live in, is destroyed, we have a building from God. Now I know so much of the New Testament is steeped in analogy and illustration. But you're catching this, right? The tent, 
okay, that I have. This, this building, I've got another one. So the tent that I'm in, I know if it's destroyed, if, if Nero or Vespian or if some Roman leader, from Paul's perspective, kills me, see, then I know I got a building from God. An eternal house in heaven, not built with human hands. Meanwhile, we groan and long to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we're clothed, we will not be found naked. There's a good phrase, by the way, for the intermediate state, and we'll talk about that in the future. For while we're in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed. No one's really looking forward to the day of their death, not in, in a practical sense, but to be clothed. We want to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal will be swallowed up with life, which is what 1 Corinthians 15 was all about. Now, it is God who made us for this very purpose, and he's given us the spirit, small s or big S? Big S the Holy Spirit, as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come, verse 6. Therefore, we're always confident and we know that as long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. Well, yeah, so I guess I spiritually connect with God, but I'm physically away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. My eyeballs aren't seeing him. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be, key phrase, underline it in your Bibles, away from the body and at home with the Lord. Okay? Now, with that in mind, I know that when I die, I will be in the presence of God. The problem is you're going to watch my body go in the ground. So the dichotomy has been separated here. I mean, true, a true dichotomy. Now, with that in mind, go to Philippians chapter 1. Okay? If that's the reality, then Philippians chapter 1 makes total sense. If I'm into soul sleep, or a lot of people that want to say that you're unconscious... Or, for that matter, talk to your Roman Catholic friends. If you want to believe in purgatory, none of this makes any sense. Okay, Unless, of course, what we just read is what it is at face value, and that is to be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Remember this phrase? For me to live is Christ. Philippians 1, 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, not if I'm heading to purgatory. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not real gain and if I go to sleep I guess that's nice but it ain't really a gain verse 22 if I'm to go on living in the body this will mean fruitful labor for me I will keep on working and serving you Paul is telling him yet what shall I choose I do not know I'm torn between the two I desire to depart to be with Christ which is far better but it is more necessary that I remain in the body okay Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I'll continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Now that makes no sense if there's soul sleep. Do you understand that? I, I mean, if, if I'm really going to go to sleep when I die, I'm thinking, hey, I might as well work for the church as long as I can. But if I know that when I die, the day I die, I will spiritually be in the presence of God then that's pretty good. See, it's, there's no debate. He's not torn between the two of sleeping or working. He's torn between the two of being with Christ, which is far better, or continuing on in the body or the flesh and serving the church. Okay? With that in mind, back to 1 uh, Corinthians, and I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. With that in mind, my dead Christian relative or friend is physically here on earth somewhere, or the remaining parts of him biologically are here, but he's spiritually in heaven. Now, this makes sense. He's coming down with Jesus, bringing with him those who have died, fallen asleep, and with the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise. What rises? The hardware, see, the body. And they meet up together now, according to 1 Corinthians 15, with a brand new kind of immortalized body. The imperishable is set aside and the imperishable is put on. The mortality is laid aside and the immortality is put on. There's a transformation. Wow, should we take that one more level? Well, let's keep going then. Thank you. Letter C. There is a resurrection. That's the first thing that happens at the rapture. Okay? There is an instantaneous resurrection. And by that I mean, and I put that in quote, quotations because I'm not talking about a dead person now. If I, back to our passage here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, am not preceded, verse 15, 
Let's just read it. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now, I know what's going to happen to them. Their decaying bodies that were, uh, that were prone to decay are now going to be raised and impervious to decay and sin, and they're going to meet up with their spirit, and now they're brand new people, okay? just like Christ, the first fruits. I'm remaining, and now I'm going to be, according to our passage in verse 17, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay? Now, whatever's happening here, I've got to go through some kind of immediate resurrection, but I'm not dead. How does that work? Okay? That's why I put it in quotations. There is something that happens at the rapture when the trumpet sounds and the voice of the archangel takes place where I've got to become like my dead relative that just got, resur got a resurrected body. I don't have a resurrected body, but I need one if I'm going to live with God forever in his presence around people that have resurrected bodies. So I have to be changed. I need an instantaneous resurrection. The amazing thing about a resurrection, as Martha and Mary put it, is that, that they stinketh, right? The bodies are decaying. That's amazing. Lazarus is in the grave four days. He, Lord, he stinketh, and, and, and yet he's going to call. Wow, that's amazing. Now, it's not, it doesn't seem so amazing to be living and be resurrected, but that's what's going to happen at the rapture. People that are alive are going to have to be instantaneously resurrected. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We've got to look at this now. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. A parallel passage does not use the word harpazo, but it gives us a, a, a better picture of this immediate resurrection or instantaneous resurrection in quotes. And if you want to put something in the margin, if you don't have a reference Bible and it's not already there, Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 is, is, is another statement of this in a very simple two-sentence format. But here's the extended version, verse 42. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. That is, the body that is sown perishable has got to be raised imperishable. 1 Corinthians 15, now I'm in verse 43. It is sown in dishonor. Sorry, it's not all that fantastic. And it's raised in glory. It's, it's great. It's beautiful. It's, it's now what it's supposed to be. It's sown in weakness. Yeah, it's so prone to all that, that decay and entropy. But it's going to be raised in dunamis, in power. It's sown a natural body with all the natural instincts and impulses of a fallen life. But it's going to be raised a spiritual body. That doesn't mean Casper the Friendly Ghost, translucent or see-through. That means it's going to have the impulses of God. It's going to be a spiritual body. I'll prove that to you in a minute. There is a natural body, he goes on to say, and a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. Now, so is the second man in some ways. He's biological material, but he's different He's not prone to the same kinds of things that Adam was. The second man was from heaven, but he dwelt in flesh. He put on human form, the incarnation. As was the earthly man, so are those of the earth. But as the man from heaven, as is, that's an important word, the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And the point is this, at this point, prophetic perfect, there is that sense that when Christ came back and showed us after his resurrection, his physical tangible body that can process and digest fish and sit there and talk and say, touch me and see my wounds, he's real, he's tangible, so it's going to be with this spiritual body. Doesn't mean it's translucent or see-through, it just means it is now reflecting and beating in sync with the priorities and agenda of heaven. Verse 50, is that where we're at? I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood, as we know it, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable, that's another way to say it, flesh and blood that we know that is perishable, neither is that going to inherit the imperishable. Now, verse 51, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, that's a euphemism for death, right? So now we must be talking about the same thing he's talking about in, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we will all be change we have to there's got to be a change because i can't inherit the kingdom with a fleshly decaying adamic body i need a i need a christ-like body when's that going to take place well it's not going to take long this is an instantaneous resurrection on the fly ha, pardon the pun verse 51 52 in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet do you see the picture here 
For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and right after that we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. So I know whatever the rapture is, here's what it is. It's loud. It's a resurrection of all my dead friends, right, that are Christians and everybody throughout church history. And it's my instantaneous resurrection, which is called here a, a changing or a transformation. Okay? First Thessalonians chapter 4. There's one more thing that we, gotta, we, we need to note about this text. Verse 16, 1 Thess 4, 16, the Lord himself will come down from heaven. So he's coming out from the top, from down from heaven, with a loud command, voice of the archangel, trumpet call of God. The dead in Christ are rising, their bodies are, because we know he's bringing their spirits with him. And after that, we who are alive and are left will be caught up, harpazo together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Where do we meet the Lord in this passage? In the air. That's very important. It's a meeting in the air. Okay? Whatever this is, it's not a meeting on the ground. This is a meeting in the air. I don't mean to make too much of this, but it's clearly what's being said here. I'm not seeing Christ come back and landing on the terra firma and saying, Hi, I, I'm back. I said I'd be back. I'm back. Okay? It's not what's happening here. He's coming, resurrecting Christians, changing my body. I'm caught up as a brand new transformed immortal body now. I get an instantaneous resurrection without passing through death. And I'm meeting him in the air. And from that point on, the meeting in the air, so I will be with the Lord forever. Okay? So what do I know about the eschatological concept of Harpazo using 1 Thess 4, verses 13 through 18? It's a loud return, trumpet call of God, loud voice. It's a resurrection of all my Christian relatives and everybody I don't know who's put their trust in Christ. It's an instantaneous resurrection for me if I happen to still be around, and it's a meeting in the air. Okay? That's what I know. The real question is, on the back of your worksheet, when and who are we talking about? What are the options? And as with everything in eschatology, we have several options for you. What do we have? One, two, three, four, five. You'd be disappointed if there were just two options. There are five options for you here tonight. Okay, if that's what it is, we need to know who and when. Okay, let's start with option number one. It's called the partial rapture. Okay, the partial rapture. Next to the partial rapture, jot down Luke chapter 21. Actually, we'll turn there. Luke 21, 34 through 36. The partial rapture. You ever heard of Watchman uh, Nee and Witness Lee? Remember those guys? The, the, the local church movement? They were some of the big, big advocates of the partial rapture. I don't think they believe it anymore. Huh. But they did. Sorry. Laid my cards down too soon on this one. Now, again, I tried to make some distinctions before, and we'll make those even clearer as we move forward. Maybe not tonight, but in the future. But it's important to note that in Luke chapter 21, Jesus is talking to Israel. And this is in the context of Israel's future. But nevertheless, here's where they get this concept of a partial rapture. Okay? Luke 21, 34. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And the day will close in on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Okay, There's the eschatological picture of some future cataclysmic event on some day of God's, uh, God's coming or God's return or God's wrath. Okay, Verse 36, here's the imperative. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape what is about to happen. Different word, it's not harpazo, but that's the picture that... Watchman Lee and Witness Lee, Watchman Nee and Witness Lee and others would say it is that what we're talking about when we say the word escape is the rapture. Be, and let's read it again. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Now that seems to be a differentiation. The partial rapture crowd looks at this passage and says he's talking to the church, which I don't believe he is, and what he's saying is if you're watching and praying when he comes back, you'll get out of the tribulation. If you're not watching and praying, you're going to have to go through it. So the 
righteous among the Christian community who are really watching and praying and not according to the t context. Just reading the text here, verse 34. Not weighed down with dissipation, not drunk or drunkards, and not filled with the anxieties of life. That crowd, that part of the church, left behind. But the other part of the church, taken. And you can see, by the way, why fringe groups love that kind of doctrine. Because they say, join our group, because we're different than all of those guys. And everybody else, they're all weighed down with the anxieties of life. We're not. We're the real holy group. And then we're not going to say they're damned. But when the rapture comes, we're going to get taken in there not. You see why fringe groups love this kind of, of view? The partial rapture? Okay. And I always think of it when I walk into a place and my secretary's not there and I don't know where she is or my wife's missing. Partial rapture, I always think. <laughs> but... But I really don't believe it. But who knows? I might be wrong. <sighs> okay, a couple problems with this view. Maybe the easiest one to, to, to respond to. But let's, let's start with this. Well, let's start with Sunday's message. Hey, how about that? What did we say about, what did we say about the doctrine of uh, the relationship between sanctification and justification? What did we say about that? It, we said that your serious efforts at sanctification prove the reality of your justification. Remember that? In other words, if you're justified, you will be making progress in sanctification. 1 Corinthians 6, if you're a drunkard, or you are weighed down with the anxieties of life, to put it in terms of, of, of the soils, you're not saved, see? So the bottom line is, if we understand sanctification and justification properly, I don't think we can say of any segment of the redeemed, genuinely justified church, hey, you know what, you live like non-Christians, and all that means is you're going to catch the bus at the next stop. We're getting on early because we're sanctified people. You're just justified people. That doesn't work. See, I, I think theologically it doesn't work. I'm not saying every Christian's bearing fruit at the same level. I'm not saying every Christian's as godly as the next Christian. But all I'm saying is the dichotomy of the partial rapture is these guys are being sanctified as characterized by watching and praying, and these guys aren't. Okay? And I'm just saying, I think as a whole, we got a problem with that, okay? Another problem I have with this, that if the rapture, I'm sorry, that if the tribulation is seen as an outpouring of God's wrath, and what God is doing here with the partial rapture is allowing the righteous to escape and allowing the kind of, well, you know, they're really not all that serious about their Christianity to incur his wrath in the tribulation, okay? then I think I've got something akin to purgatory right here. Are you tracking with me on that? In other words, if you're not living righteous, you're going to have to incur some of God's wrath. But, you know, if you're living righteously, you get to get out of it. Now, Catholics believe that no one really gets out of it. I've debated with them and talked to them. And, and most, you know, even Mother Teresa and the Pope, they're going to be there for a little while. You're going to be there for longer. But the bottom line is it's all based on your righteousness. And you will incur wrath in some degree based on your righteousness. That's what, exactly what's being said here with the partial, partial rapture view, as I've read it, from people that, that uh, propose this view. So, my point is, Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Doesn't make sense. There is no purgatory and there is no, if that's the view of your partial rapture theory, there is no partial rapture. Back to something a little more concrete. We just read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse number 51 and 52 needs to be reread. If I want to put to bed this whole concept of the partial rapture, all I got to do is read 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 again carefully, and I'll recognize there seems to be no room for a partial rapture here. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Okay. Now, how and when do we all get changed? verse 52, in a, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, okay? In other words, if we all get changed, even those who die in Christ and they get resurrected bodies, and all of us get changed also at the rapture, when in a flash in the twinkling of an eye, then I'm thinking all of us get changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. I don't see a, a room for a differentiation, okay? It's the least popular view on the list, but you do need to know there are some people out there pushing a partial rapture, and it's fun to joke about from time to time when you don't know where your wife is, but the bottom line is there's no biblical room for this in my thinking, okay? Partial rapture. So I don't believe in the partial rapture, and I don't think you should either, and this is the most aberrant view of all of them, I believe. 
Good enough? Wow, that was fast. It was also the easiest one. Let's go to number two, letter B. Let's talk about a post-tribulational rapture. Now, this is a bit harder and much more popular. The popular view here is that the church is going to go through this thing called the tribulation, however one might define the tribulation, depending on their view, and there's only one event at the end of, of time where God takes his church and returns to the Mount of Olives and sets up his kingdom. And let's just talk within the pale and, and the framework of premillennialism. Right? You are here last week? Premillennialism. We believe there's a future for Israel where he'll fulfill his Old Testament promises to that nation, that national Israel. Now, they're saying at the end of the church age, there's only one event. The coming of the Lord, the rapture of the church, the resurrection of Christian bodies. All of that one time. That is the post-tribulational rapture view. Okay? And that has some things going for it. Here's the things it, it has going for it. And, and you hear this a lot, and it seems to be at the top of their list. And I just, I mean, I think it's an easy one to, to respond to. But I find more people than not, especially in today's climate of, you know, kind of soundbite theology, uh, here's one of the reasons people hold to this. It's the oldest view. I hear that all the time. <laughs> that is not real convincing, I hope, for the student of scriptures, but it's often discussed. That the reason I'm a post-tribulational rapturist is because it's the oldest view of the church. And they will quote many church fathers, and they'll quote lots of people uh, from church history that this has been in, in their pers from their perspective, and rightfully so, we can concede a lot of their, their points, that this has been a popular view for a really long time in the church. Okay? But I hope you go, well, okay, I don't know. That's not a really big point, right? Because, let's, let's invert this for a second. I often talk about chronological snobbery. You've heard me talk about that. C.S. Lewis's phrase, I steal that from him. And, and we always think that we got the best. Well, I recognize that. People have that. But I think we can also invert that. And some people have, and I just made this phrase up, they have a veneration of antiquity. They have a veneration of antiquity. They love whatever's old. And if it's old, it's good. And I don't mean just, you know, the 100-year-old hymns. I'm talking about the 1,000-year-old views theologically. And there are some that respond to chronological snobbery by saying, well, if it's old, it's right. And I've sat there and, and, and gone round in circles with people that they really, I believe they have a view that if it's old, it's right. And, and I just think, um, I just don't think that's a very strong point. And I'll tell you why. Here's a couple of reasons why. One is, we have seen throughout church history, the church grapple and define doctrinal truths in seasons. Okay? When the guy comes to your door and he says, oh, did you know the Trinity, that was all created by Constantine in the 4th century. Okay? See, that wasn't a southern accent, by the way. Some of you are complaining all my accents that are bad are southern accents. That wasn't southern. That was the drunk man, right? I got in trouble last week, and every voice I made was a southern I'm not trying to say it's the only accent I can really do. And it's not even it's the best one I have in the arsenal. I was making no comments about the South on Sunday. So where was I? The guy knocks on your door. You know, the <laughs> he says something like, he probably sounds like me. You know, the Trinity was, it was created in the, in, in the fourth century by Constantine. You know that, don't you? Right? Now... The points that they make is they hand you their little color brochure with all those oil-painted pictures of Jesus. They, they hand you that, I don't know, they all look like they're coming from the same guy. Uh, right? Am I right? Yeah. All right. Uh, and they'll quote all these things about what's going on in the 4th century about the Trinity. Okay? Now, a few things happened in the 4th century. The shift from Greek to, to Latin was taking place. The legal language of the culture was starting to define doctrine in Latin terms. They were debating the people that were trying to deny the deity of Christ. And for the first time, in very solid terms, with some, with some meat on the bones, they started to define the concept of the Trinity. It wasn't that people didn't believe that before. It's just it was the time where the church turned its attention to the concept of, of, of the Trinitarian truth that comes out of the, out of the scriptures. 
Before that, yeah, you got statements, but you didn't have the powerful, systemized response uh, to those that denied the deity of Christ. Okay? We see that in a lot of issues. Even you could argue, I suppose, that the justification, forensic justification, imputed righteousness of Christ to the non-Christian, okay, was really clarified at a whole new level during the Reformation of the church, right? I mean, that was when the church really focused in and honed in on clarifying what exactly it meant to have the imputed righteousness of Christ in your life, to be saved by faith, not by works. Well, it wasn't that they didn't understand that before. It's just that it, they didn't have the powerful, clear defense and articulation of that doctrine. So just because some issues in eschatology may have been clarified of late doesn't mean that it's wrong. See what I'm saying? It just doesn't mean that if it's, if it's, if it's old, it's right. And the veneration of antiquity argument, um, I struggle with that. Okay, it is an old view, and it has a lot going for it in that regard. The church has definitely been, uh, been big on this for a long time. But my point was, it can be observed that the church has refined its understanding of God's word on various topics in various seasons. Okay? Secondly, the thing that they say that it has, that it has going for it is that the concept of the church going through the tribulation is consistent with promises about the church going through tribulation. Did you follow that? The argument that the church will go through the tribulation is consistent with passages that show that Christians will go through tribulation, right? John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world you will have, there it is, phlipsis, the Greek word, tribulation, translated trouble, translated suffering, but it's the word phlipsis, which by the way is 42 times in the New Testament, the word phlipsis, the Greek word, and, and, and uh, phlipsis, uh, which is, translates tribulation, uh, it also translates suffering, affliction, difficulty, trouble. Okay. But I hope, and even the way I phrase that, you understand that my response to that, yes, we are not immune from suffering. We will go through tribulation and trials. There is a difference between the tribulation and tribulation. Right? Can you see that distinction? That's pretty clear. And you could go to various places in the Bible. Um, for instance, let's see. How about Matthew 24, verse 21? I'll just read it for you because i got three passages here. Matthew 24, verse 21. There will be a great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until then. Talking about in the present perfect. Uh, until that point, until now. Never again to be equaled. Okay? That is a kind of tribulation that's different than other kinds of tribulation. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. Revelation 7, 14. I answered, sir, you know, and he said, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation, which is, is, is even in Greek, it's a stronger than just a simple adjective. It's a great tribulation. It's the tribulation, the great one, literally. The tribulation, the great one. So it's modified. It's not just any tribulation. The tribulation talked about that 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, is the tribulation. There is a coming tribulation unlike any other. Daniel, by the way, speaking of Daniel, the 70th week of Daniel, he closes his book in chapter 12, verse 1, by saying this. At that time, Michael, who happens to be the archangel, <laughs> who's called here the great prince, who protects your people, Israel, he will arise, and there will be a time of distress that has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name was found in the book of, uh, written in the book, will be delivered. What's the point, though? There's going to be a kind of tribulation that isn't just tribulation. It's the great tribulation. And that's why we call it the great tribulation. It's different than the rest of the tribulation. And a lot of people view other views of the, of the rapture as some kind of escape mechanism. It's not. The church is going to suffer. Matter of fact, we will suffer because we are the church. But there's something about the great tribulation that's different than tribulation. But one of the things that people have going for this post-tribulational view is that the church wasn't promised an exemption. And I totally get that. One of the problems with the post-tribulational view as well, if we are premillennialists, in the, in the millennial kingdom, people will marry and be given in marriage and have children and procreate. They will fill the earth during the millennial kingdom. That's the teaching of the millennium. Very few people dispute that. 
Okay? One of the problems with the rapture being at the end is that we'll all be changed who will go through the rapture, right? Everybody. And we will put on immortal bodies like Christ. The kind of body that Jesus described is not given, not mar- it doesn't marry and is not given in marriage. Well, that creates a problem for the millennium. You see that? Post-tribulational rapturists have that kind of dangling problem. How do we populate the millennial kingdom if all the people saved during the tribulation, including the church and Israel, if we all get translated immortal bodies? And, and that is that is one of the another problem with the post-tribulational rapture. And of course, for all the proponents, none of those are insurmountable. But and I don't have time to keep going because we're almost out of time. But there's a lot of things for it, but there's a lot of things against it. And and I personally am not buying it for what that's worth. Let her see. There's the pre-wrath rapture. You ever heard of this one? The pre-wrath rapture. Now, the pre-wrath rapture is not the post-tribulational rapture, which, by the way, the pre-wrath rapture does solve the problem of, well, let me define it first, then I'll finish that sentence, which you already finished in your mind already. Here's the pre-wrath rapture. Uh, Marvin Rosenfeld, the uh, uh, Zion's fire. Some of us, I don't know how you get on his mailing list, but once you get on it, you never get off of it. Uh, <laughs> Um, bottom line is, uh, he is the one who popularized this probably, I don't know, 20 years ago almost. Uh, the concept that we will go through the tribulation, but we will be raptured. More on this when we get to the, the uh, Revelation survey. We will be raptured after the sixth seal. Okay, Because his argument is the tribulation is a tribulation, but when the, after the sixth seal is opened up, then God's wrath starts. Now, the church is going to be delivered from God's wrath because he doesn't believe that the church is destined for God's wrath. But it doesn't happen at the beginning and it doesn't happen in the middle. It happens sometime right before the end. Now, depending on who you're reading on the pre-wrath rapture view, they're anywhere between the three and a half year mark. No one's at the three and a half year mark. But they're sometime between the three and a half year mark and the Battle of Armageddon. Sometime in that last section of the tribulation, Christ comes and grabs his church. And Israel continues to be converted, and those people populate the millennium. And that's what I started to say. It does solve the problem of populating the millennial kingdom. Because there are people after the pre-wrath rapture that become followers of Messiah and enter into the millennial kingdom with non-redeemed bodies, non-immortalized bodies. Pre-wrath rapture. Not a super popular view, but growing, it seems. I mean, it certainly made a splash, and a lot of people responded to this. And it depends on who you run with or who you read, but if you want a response to it, um, a guy named Paul, Paul uh, Carlene wrote a little book uh, called The Pre-wrath Rapture of the Church. Is it biblical? And so if you do encounter this and you want to respond to it, um, there are, there are a lot of issues that don't really add up here. Um, it's somewhat arbitrary. But if you want more on that, you can read that book because a lot of people aren't buying into that. But they do buy into this one, the mid-trib rapture. Okay, we've got the partial rapture view. Mm, don't think so. We've got the post-tribulational rapture view. That's very popular, has been historically popular. It's got a few problems. There seems to be a distinction between tribulation and the great tribulation. But the mid-trib view at least has this going for it. That the tribulation is clearly broken up into two parts. And we read this last week. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. He, this great leader, and when I say great, it just means powerful, not good. He will confirm a covenant with the many for one seven. And in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. On the wing of the temple, he will set up abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, there's three different ways it's described. Four different ways. Halfway through the seven, which is three and a half years, it's described as times, time, time, times, and half a time. If you remember that, we'll get into that a little bit later when we look at the tribulation. In other words, time, that's one year. Times, that's two years. That's three. And half a times, that's three and a half. It's described in Scripture as 1,260 days. That's a clear delineation of halfway through it. And according to Revelation 13, 5, it's also described as 42 months. 
So something significant is taking place halfway through the tribulation. And the mid-tribulational rapture people say this, hey, we get to not exempt the church from the tribulation, like those pre-tribulational guys, and we get to say they go through tribulation, but they don't go through the wrath of God's part of it, and it's not arbitrary after the middle point, it happens at the middle point, because that's an important delineation in Scripture, the mid-trib view. But like the pre-trib and even the pre-wrath guys, the second coming and the rapture of the church happen at two different times. problem with this view there's no clear connection in scripture between the rapture of the church and the halfway point the halfway point is clearly a point where the leader the antichrist as we'll see makes some kind of change with the people of god israel but no connection to the rapture of the church no clear connection at least and again we don't have time to parse it much more than that let's get on to the last one then there's the pre-tribulational rapture this is the one all the christians hope is true right oh i don't want to go through the trib that sounds terrible and we haven't even studied it yet. Maybe that's why I did it, so you wouldn't have that fresh in your head. What a terrible time. I don't want to go there. The pre-trib rapture is not about escapism. It's not about avoiding tribulation. It's based on a few things. Based on this, this is my humble opinion, my numbskulled concept but I think it makes the most sense. Here's why. Number one, the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, the last seven years, that Revelation is all about the seven-year period, the 42 months plus 42 months, the 1,260 days plus 1,260 days, the time, times and half a time, times two, the seven-year period, okay, is presented in Scripture as decreed for Israel and Jerusalem. That, to me, is a big point. If the whole point of the rapture, I'm sorry, of the tribulation, is to prepare Israel to receive the Messiah, and the point of even purifying them, as it's said in the Old Testament, and preparing them in, in the time of Jacob's trouble for the embracing of Messiah, and it is decreed as a part of the 70 weeks of Daniel as, as the last seven years, and it will be for Israel and Israel's city, Jerusalem, Daniel's... Daniel city, your holy city, then I'm thinking there is a disconnect between the mystery program called the church that we talked about. The church doesn't seem to have a role in the tribulation from a biblical perspective. Now people argue that, but there is a distinction there that is enough of a distinction to say, I don't see the biblical precedent or reason for the church going through the tribulation. And if you say, well, the tribulation is promised again i get back to the distinction there's a difference between the tribulation and tribulation the tribulation is different than tribulation secondly i see a biblical expe expectation of imminence we've talked about this before but i think there is a biblical precedent of imminence for the church i see this as distinct as the as the non-imminent passages of the return of christ for israel Israel is supposed to know when Messiah is returning. The signs will be clear. For the church, the expectation is to look for his coming always and always be ready. And I see that as enough of a distinction to say there that if, it's, if, it's bibli if there's a biblical eminence, then I, I see again the fit that the tribulation, I'm sorry, the rapture before the tribulation then makes sense. In other words, we don't have to check anything off the, off, the, off the calendar to see it as a reality. Examples, and there's several, but 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. 1 John 2, 28. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Statements like that are throughout the epistles. That If you're going to be ready for this, you need to always be ready for this. The only way to not be surprised by the coming of Christ is to always expect the coming of Christ. That's called the imminent return of Christ. There's, you're, you're always ready for it because you don't know when it's going to happen. If the tribulation is a, is, a, is a marked period of time, starting with a covenant of a world leader with Israel, and halfway through it's broken, and 1260 days after that, the coming of Christ and Jesus on the Mount of Olives, the signs of what Jesus talked about in the Olivet Discourse, 
in Matthew 24, in the book of Revelation, you should be able to set your watch and be able to know when Christ is coming back. Church doesn't have that kind of, of, of explanation of the return of Christ. It's a always ready thing. It's a always be ready thing. Distinction of Israel and the church, 70 week of Daniel's not for the church, the biblical eminence of the return of Christ. And some people, by the way, may say, um, again, well, this is all new. It's really not. I mean, you may be able to prove that a lot of people believed in a post-tribulational rapture early in the church, but with the exception of the Alexandrian church fathers, and if you know what that is, that one section of northern Africa, most of the church fathers preached an imminent return of Christ. And even the reformers. I got one quote from Martin Luther. Martin Luther said, I believe that all the signs which are to precede the last days have already appeared. Let us not think that the coming of Christ is far off. Let us not look up with heads, let us then look up with heads lifted up and let us expect our Redeemer's coming with longing and a cheerful mind. And that's a common teaching from the beginning of the church all the way through the modern age. Now, there are people that still believe in some kind of post tribulational rapture, but the concept of eminence often flowed through the church that would lead us to believe that there is nothing, as Martin Luther clearly says, that needs to happen before we are taken up to meet the Lord in the air. Lastly, thirdly, and just for the sake of brevity, it seems to harmonize with the promises to the church in Scripture. It seems to harmonize well with the promises to the church in Scripture. While we are promised to go through tribulation, there is something in Scripture that seems to be clear here about the fact that the great tribulation, the great wrath of God, we are going to be protected from, not just at the judgment seat of Christ, but on the earth. Revelation 3, verse 10, good example. It says, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is to come on the whole earth to test everyone who lives on the earth. The picture of the concept of the whole world, this time of Daniel 12, the terrible time since nations began, there is a promise of deliverance. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And this again, why don't we look at this one? When this, this is our last, it's all we have time for. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thess 5, verse number 1. We see eminence here. I think we see distinction from Israel here. I think we also see the promise of exemption of the great time of, of trial on the planet. First Thess 5, 1. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we don't need to write you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, if you're really assembling the concepts of Daniel's prophecy, the Old Testament covenants, the promise of the ruler with the many and the breaking of the covenant, then I'm thinking dates and times are pretty darn important. But when it comes to the church being instructed by Paul, it seems to say, listen, you're the eminent, it's going to come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness so that the day should surprise you. Why? Because we're always ready, and if we're always ready, we're not surprised. Verse 5, you are sons of the light and sons of the day. We don't belong to the night or the darkness, so then let us not be like the others who are asleep. Let us be alert and self-controlled, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a passage, I think, that makes the distinction between Israel and the church enough clearly in the pe passage to see diff differing programs, the eminent return of Christ, and the promise of exemption from the coming wrath of God, which the book of Revelation is all about. The time, uh, here's a good passage too, we won't turn to it, Revelation, Revelation chapter 6, verse 7, the great day of God's wrath, the wrath of God and of his Lamb. I mean, this is a time of God's wrath being spent, and the exemption seems to be complete, and it seems to be a harpazo, and it seems then to necessitate two phases of Christ's coming, one to meet us in the air, and one to put his feet on the Mount of Olives. Now that's not going to be satisfying for some people, but there's more to come. As I say every week, like a bad drama on Thursday nights, <laughs> stay tuned. There's more to come. Let's pray together. God, thanks for our time. Thank you for our opportunities that we face. 
Thank you, God, for your word, and I pray that we continue to be good students of it. God, I know there are varying opinions on a lot of this stuff, as I say every week, but I pray we'd be respectful, that we would be good students, that we'd be fully convinced in our own minds, and God, that ultimately we would all look with a great sense of expectation, as Martin Luther said, for the coming of Christ. With joyful expectation, make that a reality for us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.